FM Radio for the Agile Community. www.agile.fm My guest today is Mark Hurst, the CEO of uh, Creative Good, and uh, here's an interesting fact, the world's first and oldest customer experience consulting firm, uh, founded in 1970, if I'm correct. Well, first of all, welcome to the podcast, Mark. Thanks for having me, Joe. Is that true, 97? 1997, in the previous millennium, yes. And the world's first and oldest customer experience, it's almost like St. Augustine, Florida. <laughs> well, when I started the company, a lot of people looked at me funny. What is customer experience? Why are you so concerned with customers? Um, but I had a sense that in the new online economy, uh, customers were going to have a very important role in determining the successes and failures. And um, that, in fact, is what has happened. We can see that. Mm -hmm. uh, having come true over 17 years mm -hmm. and we're continuing to do the work because customers are still very, very important and uh, many teams and companies uh, have some improving to do in how they listen to the customers. Right. So you're a pioneer, uh, not only because you started that uh, comp the company back in 97, uh, you're a pioneer in customer experience. You're also the author of the book, Customer Included. Um, and that is a talk you're going to give at the Agile Day on the 18th of uh, September in New York City. And um, why is this book called Customer Included and not Users Included? Do you uh, differentiate between these two things? Well, uh, it's a, that's a good question. Um, customer is a good generic term for the person who's on the receiving end of some product or service or experience. Um, the book covers some technology case studies where there are users Uh, involved, for example, uh, Google Wave is a case study, and um, Netflix uh, has a case study. Those are all users, obviously. But there are some case studies um, covered in the book that do not involve technology users, such as um, a public park here in New York City. There's a case study about Prospect Park. You don't talk about users of a park. You talk about visitors or residents or citizens or something. Right. And yet the same, uh, same patterns hold, as it turns out, in customer experience. Whether you're talking about a uh, Netflix website or a Google Wave dashboard or the experience of walking into a public park, a lot of the same patterns drive whether the, 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 the service or the experience turns into a success or a failure. Mm -hmm. And thus, um, the, the word customer is used to capture all of those use cases, whether they're users, customers, citizens, patients, students, or some other type of mm -hmm. person. Passengers, guests, I, I see always <coughs> these commercials on, on airplanes. And, uh, but at the end of the day, it comes back to that uh, one thing. Why do you think this book is interesting for the agile crowd? Well, if, uh, there's been, as you know a whole lot better than I do, there's been an upswell in interest in, in Agile methods over the last several years. And um, I, there is a, a component of Agile practice which involves listening to users or listening to customers along the way. But I feel like the industry could use a little finer grain treatment about that topic. What is the role of customers in agile development what what is the right way to conduct innovation or development uh, processes that properly include customers along the way that hasn't gotten um, enough I don't think there's been enough written and spoken about on that question and that's part of what the book is trying to address mm -hmm. so there's one uh, there's one actually one chapter of your book the first chapter is uh, um, freely available on your on your website, so people can just download that and get a um, feeling of it. And you're also almost price wise, you're almost throwing the book away um, to the audience, right? I think it's I believe ten dollars or something to get the entire book. Yeah, um, on, <clears throat> excuse me on the um, on the Amazon Kindle store, it's a ten dollar download. There's also a hardcover version, but yeah, if people want to get a, a good 
summary of the book, just go to customersincluded.com and read the introduction and chapter one for free. It's just there on the on the website. And yes, it is a responsive design, so it <laughs> looks nice on an iPhone also. <laughs> um, but my, my goal in this is uh, to get the word out about um, what I've learned over 17 years about customers and how to listen to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to to make that material available to people. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you are um, willing to share maybe a, a quick tip or something, uh, maybe a, um, a tactical hands-on thing, maybe out of that first chapter, maybe something uh, out of the book, or maybe something out of the talk, maybe something you have experienced uh, recently. Uh, maybe, oh, you, maybe you have a quick tip for the agile um, user experience designer, the engineer, the QA person who works on agile teams. Is there anything you would recommend them to do? Um, uh, I would. I would. And there's actually a case study that in, uh, in the book, it's not in chapter one, unfortunately, but it, it does cover um, a failed innovation process that used something that looks very much like Agile um, it, in the development of the MyFord Touch system. Um, people who uh, get the book can, can look it up. The, the mistake of the Ford system was that the designers... Um, went into designing and prototyping and ideating um, first without including the customers significantly before that. And by the time they got the customers involved, and and they did for some um, rapid um, rounds of feedback and and, uh, rapid prototyping, a lot of the key assumptions were already set in, in, in stone. And unfortunately, they were, they were incorrect assumptions about customers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, the, and the product failed miserably as a result, even though customers were involved later in the process in a, in a very rapid um, method. Mm-hmm. So my tip to avoid this is to understand what customers want up front. Uh, before beginning the uh, the rapid uh, iterations, mm-hmm. and how one goes out and finds out what what is it the customers want is um, not something that I can describe in a in a soundbite. It's basically <laughs> yeah. the 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 point of the entire book is to answer that question. But the tip is um, get customers involved as early as possible. Don't mm-hmm. wait until later in the process. Mm-hmm. So now I'm having this, this wonderful thank you for, uh, for sharing. And I, I do have a question though, Mark, um, for somebody who has been around and in this topic for such a long period of time, a pioneer, a 97 we mentioned earlier, uh, you started your company. Um, I do want to go back a little bit in time if that's okay with you. Um, this was a time before what what was a, a, a milestone for us in the Agile community, the manifesto, the Agile manifesto was written in 2001. Your company actually started uh, earlier than that, so there was no mani- manifesto around. Um, what kind of, um, yeah, obviously it shows the driver and the, the passion you have for this topic, but what kind of trends have you seen over the years, even before the manifesto, maybe the last 13 years since the manifesto has been out, um, you've seen influence the um, customer experience. Oh, sure. The, the The last 17 years have been just a, a, a whirlwind of um, development online, and a lot of that um, included trends and fads, some of which have, have come and gone. Um, the The agile trend, I think, is very positive for the industry in that it's it's giving teams an alternative to the traditional waterfall method, um, which, again, you know a lot better than I do is uh, all, all the advantages mm-hmm. that agile has over that. Um, I think that I, in terms of what we do at Creative Good, um, we're actually fairly agnostic about what what teams decide to use when they when they uh, go into uh, product development or um, processes. Um, many are adopting agile methods these days, and we fit into that. And others are still using more traditional methods, and we're able to to work around that. My my focus is not so much to advocate for a certain process. Um, I think there there are a lot of good people out there like you and others who are who are advocating for those improvements. Instead, my focus is to make sure that whatever the process is, customers are included in some significant way yeah. um, throughout. And that's the piece that's been missing. There are a lot of teams that are so excited about whatever new 
method or process that they that they've adopted, they they dive into it and they forget to involve customers. Mm -hmm. They they check all the boxes and they do you know all the sprints and they have the agile board up and they're doing everything quote unquote right, but customers are not particularly given a voice. And then when the product launches, the product launch is, is essentially the, the market test. It's the mm -hmm. first time the customers get to see it, and everybody is shocked when customers reject it, and it fails. And they say, how could we miss this? We, we followed the method exactly. Um, and it's simply, it's like I said before, I think not, a, not enough attention has been given to the role that customers can and should play in the process. Mm -hmm. And why... Why is it that customers are often left out is another interesting question, um, but the, for, for various reasons. But, but the fact is that customers are often left out, even when a team is otherwise um, enlightened and, and, and very agile. And that's mm. what we're trying to correct. Mm. Or maybe you could say, as a, obviously, as a joke, it's probably easier to develop uh, products without including the customer. <laughs> oh, sure it is. <laughs> it no, is no, that's a, it, no joke. That's yeah. that's a large part of it. It is much easier, and and by the way, not only easier, but it's faster mm. not to involve. And by the way, it's cheaper. So mm. if you go to the boss and you say, "We've got this process," it's going to be faster, easier, and cheaper. The boss says, you, "I can stop you right there. Let's do it." Uh, there's just one little asterisk. There's one little footnote on that process. It tends to fail <laughs> when, when, the, when the product launches. Mm. But up to that point, man, it's fast. Yeah. Well, I, very fast, right? So uh, I think uh, one example, um, not necessarily in the Agile space, but there was definitely a waterfall project but, uh, illustrating this thing. I think a lot of people have experienced the affordable healthcare website in uh, oh, past yeah. October in 2013. Yeah. Um, lots of customers not included there. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. If your listeners um, read uh, the introduction in chapter one of the book, and that's, that's the part that's it's online for free at customersincluded.com. The very first case study uh, covered in the book is a, it's very similar to healthcare.gov. Um, it's something that predates healthcare.gov. I, I would have put in healthcare.gov, except it, it, it really came to light just as the book was being published. Mm -hmm. But it's a very similar case study. It had to do with a border fence that the U.S. government um, contracted with Boeing to build in a, a, a part of uh, southern Arizona a few years ago. And it, it read the case study, see what happened. But it ended up wasting about a billion dollars of taxpayer money uh, with, with almost nothing to show for it. And when the Government Accountability Office, which is an in, a, a, somewhat of an independent auditing agency within the government, looked into the project to see what went wrong, they interviewed the people who were supposed to be the users of the system, who happened to be the Border Patrol agents. And you can could, you could read these documents. They're online. They're part of the public record. The Border Patrol agents were quoted in the reports as saying – the, the border fence project might have been a little more useful had anyone talked to us during the development process. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all but shouting, no one talked to us. We, the users, the customers, were completely ignored as the government went forward with a billion-dollar budget. Mm. And when they talked to the officials who were in charge of the project, they, the, the officials said – there wasn't enough time to talk to the users. Mm. That's why we didn't talk to them, because we were pressed for time. And that, to me, sounds like a really lame excuse. You get paid a billion dollars, and you have a couple of years. Surely you could spend a day hanging out with users to see what it is that they want and don't want. Um, so I, I think some very similar things went wrong with the healthcare.gov website. And, and again, I don't I'm biased, but I don't think the primary culprit is whether they use waterfall or some other method. I think the primary culprit is that customers simply did not play a role in the process. Mm. And that's, that is uh, a recipe for failure. Yeah. But why do you think we, we struggle so much as an, as an industry? Um, like in those 17 years you've been in this um, field and you're trying to get the message out of um, including the customers – um, obviously, in '97, there was more software development, products installed than the web movement. Now it's the mobile movement. We're building web apps, um, 
and and I wouldn't necessarily say the the customer experience is is getting better necessarily with you with mobile uh, devices either. I don't think it's just uh, moved from one to another technology. But why do you think we struggle so much with this? Because it's hard to it's hard to do. It's hard to include customers, and um, left left to their own devices, developers, product managers, executives will choose the easiest, um, least painful process in the short term. Mm. It, it takes an active effort and some discipline to take a long-term perspective and say, we are going to invest in this upfront and include users. It's going to take a little more time and energy upfront, but it's going to pay off um, once we launch. It's, you know, it's, it's almost like the law of gravity. Not many people are going to put forth the extra effort. The, the good news, which I've been trying to spread around for almost 20 years now is that that creates a huge opportunity for those teams and innovators who decide to buck the trend and actually include customers. There's a huge return on that because there's not a whole lot of competition of teams that are doing it right. Mm. Um, but it's just customers, they take time and it's hard to do. Yeah. Well, it's especially hard to do, like let's say the mobile um, app area where you build a Let's say there's a team, they're building a, a mobile app, they have an idea, but they might not even know their customers. They don't even know who they are. How would they go about that? Focus groups, things like that? or Well, I, I taught a class at um, SVA, School of Visual Arts, in the, in the uh, interaction design program uh, a couple years ago, and this came up quite a bit. How do we know what we're supposed to be working on? Because all the students, these grad students were... We're looking at um, uh, creating an app or some, some sort of project. And what I told them was, rather than going to a whiteboard and ideating and coming up with some really cool idea, why don't you go out into the world and find a problem that needs to be solved? And a problem that's worth solving. I, I don't mean we need one more app um, you know, as a social network focused on pizza or something. <laughs> um, find... Find, there are great things that are being done in mobile apps and, and, and even more great things that could be done but aren't. But, but it starts by finding an unmet need out in the world. And it could be a, a profitable um, uh, interaction where you're selling something um, or it could be something that's more in, in the social entrepreneurship uh, scope of things. But one way or the other, go find something that you've noticed in the real world, in real life, needs to be solved. Someone is looking for this solution or there's some gap in, in their life or their work that could be uh, filled or made easier by this product. That's when you know you have something. And then go to the whiteboard and do all kinds of crazy ideation. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people, I think, start – this is what I said at the very beginning. The, the tip I gave is to involve customers early. Rather than starting uh, with customers, a lot of teams will start with a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And and try to come up with the coolest freaking thing they can think of, mm -hmm. and I I think that's the wrong approach. It's better to start with what you already know is is a is an unmet need on the part of some customer out there, mm -hmm. and then and and build from there. Yeah. Um, well, there's this this other trend just to stay in the mobile app territory here. There's this there's this other trend where it seems to be like much more. App development, app development, and throw away software basically um, of these apps. So, f for example, in the past, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, if the, if you're observing another trend, but it's, it just seemed more we build more software to last. Uh, what is this now? It feels like more. Let's do app development, and if the app doesn't app doesn't work, we'll just throw it away or we'll, oh sure, we'll redo it again. How how would that influence customers? Yeah, there's there's a lot of. I mean, we should we should just state explicitly there are um, a lot of economic incentives for what you're describing this 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 throwaway software development a lot of teams are um, are looking for a quick win um, you might have seen um, on gigaohm um, the column yesterday which it was in, within the last few days so may 11th or may 12th 2014 about how this bubble is different from the the dot com bubble of the 90s mm -hmm. and it's worth reading and one of the things he says is that in san francisco in this bubble today 
um, people seem to feel entitled to write a little bit of software and then quickly get funded or cash out for a gigantic amount of money. And because people see it happening for you know a limited number of lucky teams out there. And there's a lot of money on the table where people perceive if they if they write a little bit of it's a user phrase throwaway software and hit it big, they they could become bazillionaires. And m- maybe that'll continue to happen in this bubble environment for a little while longer. But I like to take the long term view and say, you know, over the long run, the teams and companies that succeed are going to be the ones that are concerned with the long run. <laughs> and that means building building software that customers actually want to use and building it with um, rigorous uh, development and testing and QA methods that, that, that means it's not throwaway software. It's, right. it's good software that creates a good experience for, for customers. That's a, in the long run, that's going to be a much better approach. Right. Well, that's, that's, these are awesome thoughts here, Mark, and uh, I do want to um, just uh, throw out another um, um, opportunity here to uh, actually expose your conference. You're actually also a conference organizer, um, the GEL conference. Um, you've been organizing for quite some years, and uh, you have some interesting speakers there. Uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, too. Uh, speakers who have shown good customer experiences in the past. Uh, and they become a platform to uh, present themselves and their products. That's right. Uh, GEL is a conference I founded in 2003. So last year, we had our 10th anniversary event here in New York City. And we had people like um, uh, Robert Hammond, who's a co-founder of the High Line, which is a really popular uh, park and tourist destination here in New York. Uh, we had Ben Kaufman, who's the founder and CEO of Quirky.com, which is a really interesting company. Um, we had Rachel Sheckman, who's got an incredibly uh, innovative a retail store um, in West Chelsea here in New York called Story. Um, a bunch of bunch of really great speakers. And those those talks, by the way, are all online at gelconference.com. People can watch them for free. Right. But uh, one thing that I'm really excited about over the years, having run, uh, I think, 12 events in 10 years, is that Gel has a track record of having debuted a lot of speakers before they were at other major events. Um, for example, um, Jimmy Wales spoke at Gel in, in uh, I think, 2006 or so. And I believe it was the first time he'd ever spoken about Wikipedia publicly on stage. Um, And I tried to tell the audience, (laughs) take note, this project is going to be big. (laughs) And uh, so it was. Um, Marissa Meyer, who's now the CEO of Yahoo, uh, her first conference uh, speaking slot ever was at Gel in 2003. Um, Sal Khan, if anybody's a fan of Khan Academy, uh, his very first conference talk about Khan Academy was at Gel uh, before uh, he went on to uh, other larger conferences. And those, um, the, the Jimmy Wales talk and Sal Khan talk are, are online. Um, and I, I like to find people who are going to do something great, and we haven't heard from them already 20 times at other conferences. Mm-hmm. Um, makes it a little a little bit of a challenge to, um, to to find those projects and those innovators, but in every case, I'm trying to find people who are committed to creating a good experience, whether it's in online education, like what Sal Khan was doing, or you know, in the design of a new park, which is what Robert Hammond certainly did with the High Line. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to show to demonstrate to the world that. A good experience is not simply something that, that that you know a consultant talks about in terms of a product development process. You know, <laughs> good experience infuses our lives and our work in all sorts of areas. I mean, um, every everything from from where where you shop and where you walk in a park to what you buy and what you read. Every, everything is affected by how good the experience is, and what better way to explore the patterns. Um, involved in that than to learn from people who are doing it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a really, it's a fun project, and I'm, I'm planning on bringing the next event back to New York in the spring of 2015. Um, so people can just, uh, uh, they can sign up for my email newsletter if they want to keep in touch, and that's on the Gel Conference site. Well, Mark, you seem to be uh, specialized in finding, uh, finding customers and uh, finding good speakers for your conference, and uh, um, soon to be famous speakers for your for your conference. So uh, 
Um, I'm excited to um, have you actually present at the Agile Day uh, in New York on the 18th of September. Just want to repeat this one more time. For our listeners, if you are in the New York City metro area in September, the 18th of September, we have our Agile Day. And you can hear Mark uh, talk about customers included, a book he um, um, he has available, and uh, we'll make sure we have some copies on the conference floor. Uh, you can also buy it um, on Amazon and uh, download, get an appetizer on, on your website. That's right, customersincluded.com. Awesome. Thank you. Well, Mark, I do want to thank you for taking uh, your time uh, for um, you know talking to the Agile FM listeners about your thoughts about uh, customers. Uh, we said uh, in the beginning before we uh, recorded, we wanted to uh, keep it as long as somebody would do the dishes so they can listen to uh, this podcast while doing the dishes. And I think we achieved that. Um, not too long, not too short. Uh, I hope your dishes are done by now, uh, whoever's listening. And uh, I want to thank you, Mark, for spending the time with me. I think you had some great insights. Thanks, Joe. And um, thank you for providing this great resource to the Agile community. Nice work. Thank you for listening to Agile FM, the radio for the Agile community. I'm your host, Joe Krebs. If you're interested in more programming and additional podcasts, please go to www.agile.fm. Talk to you soon. Thank you.